Hello and welcome to Somerville Media Center Live for June 18th, 2020. I am Joe Lynch. Once again, this is the state delegation update with State Senator Pat Jalen and State Representative Mike Conley. Good afternoon. How are you both doing? Senator Jalen, doing okay? So far, so good. Excellent. Rep Conley, things in Cambridge any different than they are here in Somerville? Uh, we're all doing the best we can. Excellent. Excellent. If you don't mind, we'll start with um, today, we'll start with Rep Conley on the state House of Representatives side. We haven't seen each other in a couple of weeks. No, and um, you know, we've been busy. We've taken up uh, legislation to uh, help improve voter access um, relative particularly to COVID-19, uh, wanting to make it a lot more uh, possible for people to vote from home, um, while also wanting to ensure that uh, those who do choose to go to the polls uh, can do so in the safest way possible. Um, really, you know, I think the main focus since we've last met has been um, the murder of uh, George Floyd, you know, at the hands of uh, Minneapolis police. Um, and I've, I've actually referred to this as the lynching of George Floyd as, as you consider um, just the grotesque way um, that, you know, three police officers stood over his body and, you know, one officer pressed his knee into him and the fourth one looked by. So it, it has been certainly, <clears throat> I think, a, uh, a long overdue reckoning uh, on issues of systemic racism uh, and police brutality. And that has been on top of an ongoing uh, pandemic from COVID-19. And all of that is in addition to uh, widespread economic hardship. So certainly, um, if, if we weren't busy and um, didn't have our challenges in front of us last month, I think we have even more challenges ahead of us now. Um, but certainly it's great to um, have a chance to update you and, and to be in conversation about uh, where we're going. Let me ask you one quick question, Rep Conley. You, you know, the outpouring um, and the demonstrations, uh, the Black Lives Matter, defund police, um, as you say, you know, if it wasn't enough to be in the middle of a global pandemic, um, we now have front and center in front of us an opportunity to change the way that things have been traditionally done. Do you sense that we as a society can do this quickly during the pandemic? Or is this going to be another thing where a murder of a black man by police is going to have attention and then fall by the wayside? I'm certainly hopeful that we've come to the point where real systemic change um, can happen and is necessary. You know, as I'm, I'm currently preparing a um, sort of a statement to reflect some of the proposals that are now coming through the House of Representatives to address uh, police brutality and to provide more oversight. And as I was drafting that statement, um, it dawned on me that it must have been six years ago. I participated in a Black Lives Matter protest uh, here in the city of Cambridge where we laid down in the street um, as an act of, of demonstration. And it just had me thinking, wow, you know, this was six years ago, here we are today. It seems like we've seen this scene repeat itself over and over and over again. Rep uh, Carly, do you, remember, do you remember what the protest was? Black Lives Matter six years ago? Yeah, it was it was a Black Lives Matter protest, and um, you know we were uh, protesting. Uh, I think a series of uh, police shootings and, and police killings of unarmed black men, um, and it's a scene that you know repeats itself over and over again. Um, so I'm hopeful that we can see systemic change. I mean, I may have talked about it on this program before. But, you know, I don't think change happens in a straight line. You know, a lot of times things can be stuck and people can be having that same conversation over and over again. And then there are moments where uh, it sort of clicks and people realize, yes, you know, we have to go in a new direction. And so I have not seen, you know, I'm now in three and a half years in office. 
the level of uh, demand for change has been incomparable to anything I've seen in terms of the emails and the phone calls uh, for people who want to see action from government. So, well, Rep. Conley, I'm with you. You know, I had to I had to try to figure out how long ago it was that I did a show on race relations in Somerville, and I had to look up. Thank God that uh, Somerville Media Center has a terrific library. And it was a result of the murder in Ferguson. And sure. I had the state, I had the mayor of the city of Somerville and the chief of police on a half hour program talking about Ferguson, could it happen here? And I will tell you, it, it does, it frustrates me to no end that that was five years ago and we're still repeating the same type of actions, the murder of black men because of the color of their skin. So that's just my public statement. You know, we'll continue to do what we can at the media center to bring these issues front and center. More to come. I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch over to State Senator Pat Jalen. Pat, on the Senate side, I assume the Senate is working on some of the same issues when it comes to defunding police, Black Lives Matter, and policy changes that you can do. Well, nothing has happened formally yet, except today we, in the Senate, passed a resolution um, about recognizing Juneteenth, and tomorrow our office is closed. So if people want to get in touch, uh, they will get an away message, unless it's an emergency, in which case I will be the one responding. So we're going to take the day for reading and reflection, probably watching some videos, like 13th. Uh, maybe some things if you want to send me from Somerville Media Center, but um, I, there's a lot of legislation been filed, hasn't been heard yet. We did right before this, right before the murder, um, my committee, Labor and Workforce Development, had reported out a bill on reinvest, justice reinvestment, which would say that the Department of Corrections budget should be reduced by a percentage equal to the reduction in number of inmates and that half the savings should be reinvested in human services and ways to help impacted communities. So that would be something that we could do that we've considered for a couple of years. Uh, the number of inmates in Massachusetts has gone way down while their budget has gone, the budget of corrections has gone way up. Um, so I think those are, that's something that is maybe low hanging fruit, but there are many bills being filed. Um, I, my concern is that we'll do something uh, that looks good and doesn't actually lead to change. I, th I think you're right that uh, this is not the first time this has happened at all. In fact, since uh, George Floyd's murder, there's been Richard uh, Brooks in Atlanta was shot because he was asleep in his car. That is not, there needs to be a lot more change uh, in how police are used. What is the function that we need uh, from that kind of, of agency? Let, let me make one comment for you, Senator Jalen, and so, I know some of the staff or your staff, Representative Conley's staff and your staff are listening. Um, when it comes to incarceration, and I, and I know this is something that Rep Conley concentrates and focuses on a lot. I have anecdotally for somebody who works in the prison system in the Commonwealth, that since we did some of the, um, forgive the term, but the reshuffling and trying to do early release for some of the prisoners, half of the prison, pr prison facilities, low level prison facilities in this state are now less than 50% capacity. So the question comes in from the public is, if you were able to reduce that population by 50%, why are you still maintaining the same level of funding? That would be my question. So- It was already down. It was, I can't remember the numbers right now, but we have been depopulating the Department of Corrections. Uh, and so, we need to understand why, well, we've been asking to understand, but now it, it's past trying to understand it and just doing something. I think we're, that's the good thing. It's not just 
that a terrible event has happened, but that there is sustained public um, attention and people are not going to stop, I don't think, until there is um, more action than has been in the past. It is a delicate balance to keep people's attention during a worldwide pandemic. They make choices about what's important. Um, they make choices about their own health. Um, they make choices about their own families. Uh, but certainly, and I said this on the show to the both of you before, as well as the other two members of the delegation, this is the time when the Band-Aid is pulled off and you can see how bad that wound is. And when it comes to racial equality and injustice in this country, I think it is being laid bare for all of us. So, you know, for on the Senate side and the House side, I know both of you, it's always been a, an issue that you've worked on. Um, let's move on to some of the other issues that you might be working on in the midst of COVID. Rep. Conley, you want to take it away from the House side. Are we going to get any more money from the state to assist municipalities? Are we going to get any more money from the state to assist workers? Take it away. Well, um, you know, certainly the you know the budget. You know, speaking of money, is is something that is usually um, close to being finished by now. Um, and this fiscal uh, budget cycle, we have not really started the budget process yet. You know, by and large, um, what we are hearing in the House is that. Uh, the thought is that maybe we will just do a one twelfth budget um, and sort of uh, try to fund things one month at a time to get started. You know, it's a very volatile situation. And of course, you know, and we've emphasized this so many times, uh, the best way to get the economy right is to make sure the virus is under control. You know, if, if we could avoid a resurgence of this virus, that would be the, the best Thing imaginable for the economy, um, we you know have to at least anticipate and prepare for the idea that this virus could come back with a vengeance. Um, we know what happened uh, in the in the flu back in 1918, 1919. Um, it came back worse uh, in the fall. So um, you know, in terms of money, I think we have to uh, certainly look. I, I'm looking. You know, you know me. I'm, I'm not afraid to say that the wealthiest among us or the most profitable corporations ought to uh, contribute more. Um, so I am you know, actively in conversations with my progressive colleagues, um, as well as groups like the Massachusetts Teachers Association um, to find ways to raise new money. And I, I do wanna give a shout out to our Somerville colleague, uh, Rep. Christine Barber. Uh, she recently filed a bill um, I've signed on to it, uh, and it's a concept called guilty. And essentially, uh, what that uh, has to do with is trying to close uh, tax loopholes that very large international corporations benefit from. So we're certainly not talking about the coffee shop down the street. We're talking about the multinational conglomerates. Um, and so Rep. Barber has filed this bill in this time specifically because we know it will be very challenging to find new revenue, but we're gonna to need to find it somewhere. So I'm excited about that. Um, I also recently signed on to a letter uh, to advocate uh, to Congress that they include state aid in their next stimulus bill. And so certainly, you know, we have seen a lack of, of leadership uh, from the federal level and the reason why you have, you know, federal government is when there's a crisis. So we certainly cannot do it all alone. But those are sort of some of my answers. There's no uh, perfect guarantees there, but certainly it's front and center and it's something that we're working on every day. Let me ask you a quick question about the 112th budget. Um, you know, uh, my understanding of how a 112th budget means is that you're not ready to do a 12 month so you're gonna take it month to month. Uh, it's kind of like not signing a lease. You're gonna go month to month on the rent. Right. Um, so, so for those listening, what that basically means is that the Commonwealth is having a difficult time at this point, trying to project both revenue and expenses for the next fiscal year. 
So in order for them to give themselves a little bit of room, they're going to go one month by one month by one month. And I think, Rep. Connolly, that's the same uh, strategy that a lot of the municipalities may adopt going forward as well. Is that a true statement? Uh, yeah, that yeah, that certainly sounds about right. And and to be clear, the the one month budget hasn't been agreed to yet, but that is the current conversation. Um, what happens if you don't agree to the one month budget? Um, you know, I mean, usually something gets agreed to, sort of, to keep things operating. Um, so, I would anticipate um, there would be some form of an agreement. I mean, we've had. Uh, you know, when do you have when do you have to have that agreement done by end of this month? I mean, legally, the new fiscal year begins on July one. So, um, you know, ideally, it would have to be done by the end of this month. Although, if it's going to be a true, you know, one twelfth budget, that you know could be a fairly simple um, proposal. I, my best wishes to that, Rep. Conley, Senator Jalen. You're, 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 you're attentively listening to the budget discussion. You want to weigh in on it? Uh, I think it's worse than anybody can even imagine. They were saying we have a $6 billion deficit at least for next year. And I think people are just beginning to realize that the end of July, uh, let's see how many people, um, more than a million people in Massachusetts will lose $600 a month, a week a week in their unemployment benefits. That's uh, like $3 billion in money coming into Massachusetts every month that won't be coming in. So they won't have it to spend. Uh, they won't have it to pay their rent. Uh, it's astounding. Then we've been spending federal money to prop up nursing homes and we will be using it to help daycare centers open uh, when they do, uh, child care is absolutely crucial to the reopening of all business and all work. Uh, and, and that's money that's going to go away the end of August. So it's very, very scary. Um, at the same time, there are th proposals that I support that I want to see happen. There are the stimulus checks for people uh, that don't have. Uh, W-2 forms that have uh, IDIN, um, they don't have social security numbers, but they've been paying taxes. Uh, that is, we're waiting to see if we can do that. There is emergency sick leave for people who have to use their, or run out of their own sick leave, uh, paid sick leave. That is another cost that is, people are, questioning whether we can pick it up. There's the money we promised to public schools across the Commonwealth, an absolute promise and a constitutional requirement. There is, we have to look at revenue. There's no question about it. So is it safe to say to both of you that unless the federal government gets their act together quickly, and starts providing aid to the states, and that will trickle down, hopefully, as aid to the municipalities, that we have a rough remainder of 2020 to go. And 21. And, and 21. 22. Right, right. So that leads me back, and, and the king of the segue here, um, that leads me back to something Rep. Conley was talking about, which is voting in the fall. Um, Rep. Conley, I have my own thoughts. How about you? Leave it alone, let them do absentee ballot or mail a ballot out to everybody. And then when it comes back, make sure they're a valid voter and count the vote. Which way? Um, well, I'm, I am in favor of, you know, universal uh, vote by mail. And, um, you know, we ended up coming uh, close to that, I would say, in terms of uh, the legislation that passed the House. and. Um, I'll let Senator Jalen talk a bit about the Senate, but um, generally I think we both wound up in a place where it will be a lot more uh, streamlined for people to vote from home. Um, and we also, I know in the House, we uh, cut the registration deadline in half. 
which I think is very significant. Um, you know, it used to be 20 days. It will now be uh, 10 days before election day when you can register to vote. And, um, you know, so I, I think that overall, uh, it will be a lot more um, doable for people to vote from home. And it will also, you know, we're, we're, we've asked basically uh, the best minds that the state has at their disposal to come up with the right sort of procedures to ensure that the ballot places and the polling booths are operated um, in the safest way possible. Great. Senator Jalen? So the Senate just yesterday uh, passed our version, which is very similar to the House's, which allows people to uh, vote by mail. You'll be getting, uh, if you're a registered voter, you should be getting in towards the end of July, an application form in the mail, and you can apply for absentee ballot or for vote by mail, not absentee ballots, because that's constitutional. But you can apply to vote by mail, both in the primary, which is September 1st, and in the general election of November 3rd. Uh, so then you would receive a ballot in the mail and it would go back both ways, uh, postage paid. So it will not be an extra burden. We also, like the House, have um, early voting, uh, one week for the September primary, two weeks for the, for the final election. So uh, hopefully those will, will be opportunities for people not to have to stand in line or, or otherwise uh, endanger themselves. So I'm happy about that. Uh, I know um, no one ever asked me for my opinion because I always give it freely anyway. I don't care who's asking for it. Here are my- I want to give it to us. <laughs> Let's hear it. Do it safely, make it convenient, and do it with integrity. Those are my three guidelines for this thing. And if, they, if Washington can't do it, Massachusetts will show them how. Absolutely. Sorry. Well, I want to I want to uh, move Joe to something that you know a lot about, which is um, industrial the, theft. What? Industrial oh. theft. Do you want to let us know about it? No, that? I don't want to talk. About it. Go ahead. Uh, so on Friday, the Senate had a listening session about the reopening, and we heard from the Mass Restaurant Association that uh, they expect at least 20% of the restaurants in Massachusetts to close permanently. Most of them are closed now. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to this house. Sent, the house has sent us a bill. It's a priority for me uh, to do more relief for restaurants, but already by executive order, you're able as head of the licensing commission to enable restaurants to uh, serve outdoors, and I wondered if you'd tell us how that's going. So, so anything I say is not within official capacity, but being immersed in it over the last three weeks, um, each municipality was given authority by the governor under an emergency ruling to turn over certain actions um, to the local licensing authorities. And I'm chairman of Somerville's. Um, so what we tried to design was cutting through the red tape, allowing the restaurateurs and the outdoor businesses um, to be able to quickly come back online outdoors um, without having to go through regulatory agencies such as the ABCC um, or the Cannabis Control Commission where that is a retail function. A lot of those things were handed over locally. So what we tried to do here in Somerville was streamline that issue. There are other municipalities that were able to do it very quickly because of their geographic layout. So a town that had very wide streets, had very wide sidewalks, were very, very quick to adapt to some of this stuff. Somerville, Cambridge, Boston, each were given their own way of doing it. The mayor of this city um, it did not slow the process down in my estimation. What he did was he added additional safeguards to make sure it was safe to reopen in the public for those who had already held a license for uh, an outdoor seating, whether it was private or public, and give restaurants that did not have outdoor seating a chance to cut through the red tape and get their stuff out onto the public way. Um, we, over the course of uh, four days, 
the Somerville Licensing Commission was able to process over 157 applications for outdoor or existing with new COVID guidelines. Um, many of those are already up and operating. And I wish I could give you the exact number, Senator Jalen, but it is on a rolling basis. So Somerville did not do a blanket, go ahead and open. Um, and the reason the mayor did that was because of safety reasons. We're a little different than other towns. We have much more congestion. And if somebody were to ask me, did Boston do this the right way with public health and public safety in mind? My answer is no. I saw the film footage of the North End of Boston last weekend with people sitting on top of each other, no masks on by the diners, which is permitted, but no masks on by passersby that were coming within inches of those diners. I do not, from one licensing commissioner standpoint, I didn't think that was the right way to do it. Just to let everybody reopen, throw caution to the wind, um, and hope, keep your fingers crossed that nobody gets infected. I, I was not in favor of that. I was in favor of a more phased approach that the mayor took here, which was we were given the authority on the 8th and we started opening restaurants on the 10th and the 11th. So it took a, a couple of days. I'm proud of what the licensing commission was able to do working with public health, uh, public safety, fire department, first responders, economic development, the mayor's office, and most of all, with the restaurateurs. Most restaurateurs wanted that extra time to be able to train their staff, to buy provisions, to understand what the COVID protocols were all about, and they got two to three extra days to figure that out. And I think for the most part, the restaurateurs in this city have been extremely cooperative. And there's always one or two, Senator Jalen, you know that, you know, no plan rolls out. When you roll out a plan like this very, very quickly, there are always gonna be people who oppose to the way the plan was rolled out and people who do not abide by it. The next stage that will be announced is in building or in store dining. The governor had a conference call with the municipal leaders yesterday talking about how he wanted to roll this out. Um, my understanding is that somewhere in around the 22nd, um, he may be announcing, he could announce sooner. And my understanding is the effective date that they're shooting for for that, to give enough restaurants, enough municipalities time to react to it, is in around the 29th. So at the end of the month. Um, you know, my, I, I took an informal walk through Somerville from one end of the city to the other last weekend. And this was the first weekend that, you know, some restaurants were reopening with outdoor. And I got to the Eastern part of the city and walked Broadway from Winter Hill down to Sullivan Square. I will have to tell you that I got very upset because I looked at some of the restaurants that I've licensed in this city, high hopes of making it, and knowing how they're gonna to have to operate for the foreseeable future. Mentally, I could make a note of which ones could reopen and which ones may never open again. And it's very, very sad. So I have high hopes for these restaurateurs. I have high hopes for their entrepreneurial spirit, um, for their cooperation in the way that they're doing it. And, um, you know, Rep Conley, you're gonna love this one. You can put it as on a t-shirt. Them that have will survive. Them that don't may not. And that is what's happening in the restaurant industry. Senator Jalen, I hope those numbers of 30%, 20%, I hope they're wrong. I don't suspect they are. And they may be higher in certain municipalities. That's, that's where I am. I've got another hearing tonight and another 42 agenda items. Thanks for your work. And thanks well, for having us here. You, yeah. you know, Senator Jalen, one thing that people learned about me, and I don't talk about a lot of stuff, but when I was 16 years old, I was a dishwasher in a restaurant in the north end of Boston. 
when I was 22 and got out of the Air Force, I was a waiter in a restaurant in Maine. So if you don't think I understand what these restaurant tours are going through and the people who work in those restaurants, I get it. So I'm all in. I'm going to try to get them back up and operating as safely as I can. Yeah, th thank you, Joe, so much for your service on that front. And, you know, it's a, it's a tragedy, you know, I mean, and especially when you consider, I think, how vibrant, you know, the restaurant scene has been and, and so many different, you know, establishments serving so many different uh, interests uh, to see the hit that, that, the, that the restaurateurs are taking is, is just, it's a tragedy. It's sad. I am getting a signal from the producer that I am way over because I was so long-winded on my answer to Senator Jalen. If you want to come back again next week, come back with your other two colleagues. But for Somerville Media Center, thank you, Senator Pat Jalen, Representative Mike Conley. Stay safe, stay informed. We'll see you next time. <laughs>